Climate scientist Dr. Michael Tobis returns to the Plutopia podcast with an update on the current state of the Earth's climate. The current state, it appears, is not so good. If, if we had started going down the, the road of, of moving off of fossil fuels 30 years ago, um, it would not have been a major adjustment. Back then we were saying, okay, if we don't, if we don't behave ourselves, the, the, uh, the world could warm as much as two degrees Celsius. And now we're saying, well, if we really step on things and really work really hard, the world could warm as little as two degrees Celsius. So we're already pushing, we're, we're, we're hoping for what was once considered the worst. Welcome everybody to another episode of the Plutopia podcast. I'm John Lebkoski, and uh, my partner in crime over there is Scoop Sweeney. Uh, Scoop and I are welcoming today Professor Michael Tobis, a climate scientist and software developer. Uh, Michael is based in Canada, in Ottawa, and we asked him to uh, to join us to talk about uh, mainly the concept of weather attribution, the attribution of climate change as a cause for extreme weather events. Um, I suppose there's some controversy about that. Uh, yeah, I have to, I guess it doesn't matter that much, but I've never made professors. You, you can call me doctor, but you can't call me professor. Um, I, well, uh, you're going to profess, aren't you? I am going to profess. I've got, I've got <laughs> there you go. Profess. So, um, it, the upshot of it all is, is uh, I'm not sure people are thinking about this stuff very clearly, um, and it's kind of tricky to think about it right. Um, there's definitely, um, I mean, it's silly to deny that there's climate change at this point. I find people who are trying to do that are, are just completely missing the mark. I mean, it's just sort of obvious at this point. Um, and that humans are behind it is, is obvious. And that means you're going to experience things that you haven't experienced before. But on the other hand, anytime something strange happens, people are always very quick to say, okay, that was climate change. We never had one of these before. But if you go back, I mean, we're, we're old enough in this room to remember uh, before there was a lot of climate change and weird stuff happened then too, right? So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's 1965 and you have like a, a weird storm, you know, maybe, uh, uh, I don't know what, uh, maybe a, a, a week solid rain or something in, in Texas and you go, well, that's really strange, but you didn't say, and that must be climate change. You just said, oh, that's really strange. So strange things would be happening anyway. And the question is, uh, how do we think about whether that's part of what we're doing to the climate or not? Because there, were, there are always going to be disasters. We, don't have, we didn't ever have a climate in which there wasn't disasters. So um, we have to think about it a little bit carefully. And uh, it's... Um, it it uh, is a little tricky. So uh, the way I like to talk about it is, you it, you can make sort of statistical analogies. Um, people talk about uh, people are comfortable talking about batting averages, right? The first if you if you say statistics, the first thing that comes to a lot of people's minds is baseball, and so. You could say, well, this person's hitting really well. Their batting average has gone up to 320 this year. And then they, they, they hit a double. And um, people, are saying, people in the stands are going, wow, he must have hit that because his a batting average went up. And that doesn't make any sense, right? He didn't hit the ball because his batting average went up. Batting average went up because he's been hitting the ball. And so climate doesn't cause weather. Climate is just all the weather added up together. And it's the right way to think about it is as a, as a 
package of what's likely and what's not. Um, you guys are letting me talk and you're not saying anything. I mean, I'll, I'll keep going, I guess. Well, I would just think, I mean, you said that and I was thinking, well, that if, if climate is just all the weather taken together, then if climate is changing, then inherently weather would be changing yeah, too, right? Right, right. so uh, one way, uh, <clears throat> I think Jim Hansen came up with the analogy about loaded dice. So uh, if, you load, if you load the dice, maybe you're, you're in a game where the high roll wins. And if you put, if you weight it down so that the sixes come up more often, then you're gonna see that kind of weather happen more often. And for sure, we're seeing more hot weather happen, right? That's, that's what we most confident about. And that's what is actually happening. So that's, that's the global warming part. Um, but there were always hot days, right? Um, but we're seeing more of them. So that means we're rolling more 11s and 12s. But then there's a the question of rolling a 13, right? Um, what if it's hotter than you've ever seen it before? Whether when when it's hotter than really has ever happened for practical purposes. Now the world, of course, is billions of years old, and there were much hotter periods tens of millions of years ago. Um, but uh, uh, the um, so we you can't really say it's never ever ever been this hot. But since humans are around, we have sort of an, a range that we that we are used to, and we're getting things like um, it, it, you know, uh, Death Valley, California, just had the hottest month ever recorded ever on Earth, for instance. Um, if you look at the July average temperature, twenty four hours. 31 days, the average temperature in Death Valley was 108 Fahrenheit. So you go, whoa, that's really something. Um, so that's kind of rolling a 13. That's That wasn't on the dice before. It, it, it happens, and, it, and that's where these attribution studies come in. These guys come out and look at the really weird events and try to come up with some... Uh, level of confidence whether they could have happened before or not and it turns out to be really hard to do that right but they try because everybody wants to know this everybody wants to think about about that um my biggest concern about all of this is that uh we're focused on the extremes and the day-to-day -day is also changing the environment around us right the uh uh, um, basically, you're you're getting um, invasive plants and, and invasive species from warmer zones, and you guys who are in like about the hottest zone you can get, you're just um, going to start losing species, and and there won't be new ones coming in to f to fill their to fill their niche because there won't be one. So. Uh, yeah, if you focus on you know, the really spectacular events, and uh, you're also missing that there's there's this general trend that we we have to deal with anyway. So I guess that's that that kind of wraps up my position on all of this. I don't know. Yeah, John uh, and I grew up in that uh, heat zone you were mentioning, and I was always accustomed to being really hot in the summer. And I thought that was you know, pretty extreme back, back in the 1950s and 60s. Right. But I have friends that I grew up with who were still out there, and they're experiencing stuff that they don't remember ever having occurred out there. So these are folks who were supposedly immune to the impact of heat, but all of a sudden they're getting heat strokes and they yeah. never had them before in their lives. Well, on the one hand, the best yeah. people to listen to are the homebodies, the people who've been in one place all their lives. They're the, they're the ones who have like the most insight to what's happening in terms of what's actually on, happening on the ground where they are. Um, it's, yeah, the scientists can come up with statistics, but it's the people who are living there who are experiencing it, who uh, say, well, this 
you know, this this used to come out in, in April and now it's coming out in March or whatever. Um, and everywhere you go in the world, people are having these experiences. On the other hand, we're also getting older. So um, we might be more sensitive to the heat. You know, it's, it's hard to yeah. fully um, credit that, oh, yeah, I got heat stroke. Well, you, you were 20 then and <laughs> you're not anymore. So, you know, maybe that's part of it, too. Um, so it's, it's, it's tricky to extract these, these things. Um, but what we do know is we're, we're heading for uncharted waters. And uh, the last couple of years show is heading there faster than we expected. Um, it's, uh, I was always the person who said, no, no, things are going more or less as we expected. And I stopped saying that about a year ago where I, I think things are going faster than we expected at this point. And so that's not good. I should mention that uh, the thing that sort of triggered my request for this conversation was the, uh, I discovered a website uh, called World Weather Attribution. It's worldweatherattribution.org where they are actually taking time to study extreme weather events and determine whether they're connected to climate change and how they're connected to climate change. And I thought that was a pretty interesting thing. I, I took a quick look at it. I, I wasn't familiar with it before you mentioned it. And, and they seem to be doing uh, a good and responsible job. I didn't see anything that really screamed out at me as, as something I would, I would be worried about. But on the other hand, it is it is really hard to do, and uh, to some extent, it's based on computer models. And there are different ways of thinking about it using computer models. But the thing is, the computer models are quite good at a very very large scale, but these events often are happening in a particular place, and the models aren't that great at that. So. You're, you're kind of looking through a, a, a darkened glass to begin with. And um, I'm wondering about this. Uh, yeah, we talked about that last year when we had, uh, when we had big fires. So um, is that unusual? It looks totally scary. Um, the... the uh, there was a really big disastrous fire here. Well, not here, on the other side of Canada. Um, I don't know if you guys heard about it. It's really big news here. Yeah, I, heard, I did. Uh, so, so it, this is not a you know insignificant town in the Canadian mentality, Jasper, Alberta. It's a it's a very famous town, and uh, it, over half of it got burned down in a forest fire. And there's a lot of finger pointing between the province and the federal as to whose fault it was. Of course, they're run by different parties. So uh, the, the politics of it has gotten really ugly really fast. But the fact is that there's a major resort town that everybody loved and it's, it's torched, it's a mess. And, um, and so what's, that, what's, what's the connection between uh, fires and cl climate? All right, so there's there's several things that, that are, are happening. Um, one is it gets hot. Two is as it gets hot, water evaporates more. So the trees, uh, the soil gets gets drier faster. Even if it rains the same amount, it's warmer, it dries out faster. On the other hand, it could rain more. Um, but the main thing that's happening in the, the uh, Canadian forests and the northern forests in the States is um, the invasive insects. So uh, these places that are really taking damage are very cold. And normally you could get like very, very severe cold snaps every winter. And they rely on that, uh, the, the, the trees rely on that keep certain types of pests out. So when it warms up and you never get like your minus 20 degree night, 
um, the, the bugs don't die and they start infesting trees that don't have other defenses because those trees were, were winter hardy. And um, so that was their defense. And those, that defense doesn't work anymore if there's no winter. So uh, I, I think it's called an ash borer that's taking over um, large amounts of, of uh, high latitude and high altitude forest and makes it like a tinderbox because basically there's a lot, a lot of dead trees. And we're seeing stands of dead trees around here too, not, not huge, but um, there is some sort of a, a, a bug that's eating the white pines and there's stands of dead white pines around Ontario now. It's pretty depressing. Is so, that the pine beetle? Is that yeah, what that is? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that, we saw those in, well, we didn't see the beetles themselves, but we saw trees affected by pine beetles in Colorado. It's becoming a significant problem there. Right, right. So, so basically, I, the biggest thing that's going for us is, uh, at least in the in the cold cold areas, is invasive bugs that eat uh, the plants. But you you also very often are getting a hot, dry summer when it really gets bad. And last year, when it was really bad and the smoke got all the way to the east coast and uh, got here, and we talked about it that time. Um, it was uh, it was very dry out west as well as as well as this other stuff happening. Well, one of the uh, in Texas at least one of the contributors to cl to climate change is the oil and gas industry. I know that because I grew up in said industry. <laughs> My dad ran a uh, a, 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 nat a liquid petroleum gas refinery in West <laughs> Texas, and so I got to know the landscape out there and how the uh, oil and gas companies had uh, really populated pretty much all the farm and ranch land uh, in West Texas. And one of the things that we learned this past week, I believe it was, we had one of the biggest fires ever, uh, wildfires ever in Texas history in the uh, panhandle of Texas. And one of the reasons for that fire uh, yeah, there were some where it would just you know uh, someone threw out uh, a burning anything and it started part of the fire it was a complex fire but one of the complexes was started by poorly maintained oil company uh, sites where they have the pump jacks out there and they have electricity that powers these and the oil companies are responsible for creating and maintaining those links from their site to the nearest power uh, source, which is, you know, usually the local uh, well, co-op. And they found that very few of those are being maintained properly. So we're getting a lot of fires and the railroad commission, which doesn't do railroads in Texas, it does the oil business. They said they're not responsible for that. And the energy czars here in Texas says they're not responsible. So the only responsible party, of course, the oil companies, and they don't have a real responsibility gene in their makeup, I believe. All right. So I got, I got a couple of things to say to all of that. One is it's all the oil companies, right? It's, it, you know, none of this would be happening if it wasn't for fossil fuels. Um, you know, 90% of human input into greenhouse gases is, is fossil fuels. And um, if it was down to 10%, we, we could handle it. Um, but it, all of it is the oil companies. But on the other hand, I have to kind of object to what you said, because I, you could call it the Smokey the Bear fan, the fallacy. So the idea is that only you can prevent forest fires because you don't want to be the person causing the spark. And a lot of people are very focused on where the spark comes from. But that's not what we're seeing is not that we're getting more sparks. What we're getting is, what we're seeing is the forest is a lot more combustible and the spark does a lot more damage. Um, like that big one in California the other week, it turned out to be a, a, probably arson. Somebody drove a car off a cliff. Um, as I understood it, they weren't in it. They were just trying to start a fire. 
and they succeeded and it was a huge huge fire um and everybody said well it's arson and you can't you know blame the oil companies for that because some joker drew drove his car off a cliff um but if it wasn't for the forest all being dry and everything being hot it wouldn't have spread so far they would have been able to control it so we shouldn't focus too much on where the spark comes from. We should be focusing on uh, how combustible the forests are. And I'm really, I'm a pessimist about forests. Um, I think uh, I, I think any species that is, you know, basically rooted in place and stays there for decades is going to be not adapted to the new climate. And so uh, it will be weaker and it will die sooner and the forest will be more combustible. So I think, I think we're just going to see a decline in forests. Um, that's one of the big things that worries me all, uh, altogether, especially as a Canadian. We have more trees per capita than any other country in the world. Mm. Uh, there, there are about 10,000 trees for every Canadian. Um, where in most countries it's like one or two trees per person. We have like 10,000 because it's such a, a huge forested country and most of it's uninhabited. So there's, there's more trees than you can count. And uh, so we're in trouble because we can't maintain the forests manually. The, there, there's just too much of it. Um, but even in places where you could you can go in and manage the forests directly, um, your your uh, trees can't move. You know, it's a it's a big deal to move a tree, and uh, you can't move a forest. So uh, the faster the climate changes, the more in trouble the forests are going to be. And there's there's not much we can do about that. So if you say, for instance, well, we'll just build more air conditioning, that's not really a solution. Yeah, I mean, the there, is, there is this guy out there saying, <laughs> there, there are people out there saying, well, uh, you know, it's, it's really all about how humans are going to uh, be. And we can always just create more air conditioners and we can uh, um, put up uh, higher seawalls and stuff like that. And sometimes you, you can do that. Um, you can put up a higher seawall in Galveston. Uh, you can't do that in Miami because of the way the, uh, the soil is, the, the ground is porous and you can't put up a wall. So it doesn't help them there. Uh, and yeah, you can't air condition the forest. So yep. there, there are things that are gonna happen that are not good. Um, and they're going to happen more and more if, if we if we don't slow down and they're if we don't slow down our emissions and there's not much sign of that yet there, there's a lot more talk hey i have to say that when i started talking about this people thought of it as a fringe issue and they just didn't care and at least that's over um people are at least thinking about it but the, yeah i mean you hear some politicians who <clears throat> maybe four have said <clears throat> climate change is not an issue. And then after that, they would say, well, it's an issue, but it's not caused by humans. And now they're saying, well, we know it's an issue now and we know it's caused by humans, but we can't really undermine our economy by trying to deal with it. Right. And, and that's so strange because it's not as if there wasn't undermining our economy all by itself. What they're really saying is that we don't want to undermine our campaign contributions from uh, those people. Yeah, there's that. So yeah, there's there's going to be there's one happening right now, right? There's a, a there's a hurricane that's a, not a not a super powerful hurricane, but it seems to be an extremely wet one, and it's going to, they're predicting that it's going to stall out over South Carolina and drop yeah, slow moving inches on on, on Charleston. And you know that's that's a tragedy. Charleston is a wonderful place, and and um, yeah, this is the hurricanes are tough because there were always hurricanes, 
and they're they have really weird statistics some years you get more some years you get less and it's not really clear why so it's really hard to say but um this this if it pans out the way it looks like it's going to pan out in the next couple of days this is going to be one to remember and um yeah so so uh i don't think that uh you know uh, a booming economy is going to help somebody who has property at sea level in Charleston. Well, a lot of it has been made about the increasing number of really severe tornadoes that have been occurring, uh, particularly in the South and Southeast. And uh, well, what do you feel about that? Do you think that's due to climate change? Uh, it, 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 it's the yeah, numbers is the kind that of we haven't had. This is the kind of question. And um, as far as I know, we don't have a strong attribution on that one. As far as I know, I could be out of date. Uh, people have been looking at it. But climate statistics are very odd. You know, you get, you'll have a decade with lots of tornadoes and another decade without lots of tornadoes, even without the big, big human caused climate change. If you go back to the, um, you know, early 20th century, there's now, it's possible that there were more tornadoes than people noticed in those days, right? If there was a tornado that passed through an unpopulated area, they might not have noticed. But the signs are that it comes and goes, and we don't know why. And so, yeah, um, there are reasons to expect more severe storms. Um, there are reasons to suspect that that might happen. Um, but we don't fully understand it. And uh, so it could reverse. Um, one story I always tell about this is if you'll remember in, in 2005, when there were like 30 hurricanes, including Katrina, and everybody said, oh, this is climate change. We're gonna be getting 30 hurricanes a year uh, from now on. And then two years later, the hurricanes went away. And there was, a, there was like 15 years where there were hardly any hurricanes. Um, so, these things come and go in, in ways that are somewhat mysterious. Science knows a lot, and I hate to focus on what it doesn't know. But uh, on the tornadoes, we don't know. I don't think we know. Um, and this is, you know, you have to take into account that I'm retired and people don't give me the latest news all the time. So uh, I, I could be behind the times, but that's, that's the last I heard about it. Well, one thing I did see in the news, and this was in the Washington Post, they were talking about how Scottsdale, Arizona, has decided to lean into the heat, and uh, they've started having ad campaigns, and they've started, like, structuring events and things so that uh, they actually leverage their heat. They they invite people to come and be in the heat. Make it a sport type of thing. Well, it'll be a boon yeah. to the heat stroke doctors at the local medical facilities, I'm sure. Uh, that's the, that's pretty weird, but I can understand it. I mean, um, we uh, uh, around here in every February, we have this thing called Winterlude. And uh, Winterlude has been getting lamer and lamer over the last few years because, uh, you know, there's not enough time to build an ice sculpture. So... Uh, uh, one, one of the things we did to adapt to cold weather in Ottawa is, is we built the world's largest skating rink, right? Yeah. So, so there's a canal that runs through town and the history of the canal is sort of interesting but not really relevant here. But anyway, there's a canal and uh, it's, it's in a beautiful part of the city and uh, so they, they come out and they groom it for an ice rink. Um, it's about five miles long and, and it, it, it's it's a big deal and and uh, there's a lot of money set up to have this happen and typically most years it's been open you know two or three months well, last year it didn't open at all and this year they managed to get it going for a small section of it for three or four days and before that the shortest had been a month and a half so yeah we've we adapted by saying okay we'll celebrate the cold 
and now we don't have as much cold to celebrate. So, hey, good work, Scott Steele. You've got the trends are on your side. But, uh, Sounds like I, you got to replace uh, ice skating with water skiing. I guess. They don't have much water there either, do they? Oh, Lord. Well, that's another concern. I mean, if there's increased heat, it seems like uh, we'd start seeing, like, locales would become drier. It's tricky. That's another tricky it's water one because the, the atmosphere holds more water when it's hotter. So you get you definitely get bigger, uh, bigger rainfalls. And like I, like I said about the thing that might happen in Carol in South Carolina next week. Um, no, this week, I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm thinking this is a weekend because it's a long weekend up here. Um, anyway, so. Uh, yeah, so there's going to be there's more moisture in the air, but there's also more evaporation. Um, Texas itself was, you know, some places they're very confident of increased uh, uh, moisture, and there's some places they're very confident of decreased moisture. And when I looked at it when I lived down there, um, Texas was right on the line, and they didn't know. So again, I have to give you an I don't know. Um, it definitely seems like West Texas is getting drier. Um, but boy, have there been a lot of floods in Houston, haven't there? Well, we had a very dry summer here last year, but this year it's been pretty wet. Mm -hmm. by, by comparison, anyway. Yeah, and, uh, and it hasn't been, I don't think it's been as hot this year as it was last year. Uh, not as many triple, di triple digit days so far. We've had, you know, it's rare, but we've, I, I do watch the weather in Austin. And we, we do have, we've had a half dozen days here that were, we were hotter than Austin and that drives me crazy. I hate it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's come up this, this summer. We, uh, <clears throat> we had some real hot spells and, and you guys had some wet, wet periods and, well, one hot spell that's been going on in uh, West Texas, uh, not so much from the weather, but uh, methane being uh, pitted out and flared off by the various uh, oil and gas operations out there. I grew up around that. I always thought that was a normal setting for a refinery was to have a bunch of flames going up out of a big stack. And I found out... <laughs> To my chagrin, that, that that's not a good thing. That we were poisoning our. It's, it's better to burn it than to let it go and not burn it. Yeah, and there's a lot of the let it go that's going on because there are <laughs> many uncapped, uh, abandoned wells that no one's taken responsibility for. There's thousands of them in Texas, and right. all the oil companies just said, "Not our problem." Yeah, well, that's 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 uh, that's a major flaw in capitalism. Is is disposal costs right you uh you make all your money and then you sell off your 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 assets to something that's designed to go bankrupt yeah one of the disposable things that's causing a problem they're getting earthquakes in my neighborhood of west texas mm -hmm. and it's from the injection fluids that they're putting back into the ground and uh there's only so much that can go in before the uh surrounding uh, geology goes, uh, this is not good. We're going to <laughs> protest. And their protests have been around, you know, some four and five, uh, you know, uh, earthquakes. I, I, I experienced a fracking earthquake once. I was uh, in a motel in Oklahoma driving north. And uh, I, I got a little, a little shaking. And it's not normally a seismic zone up in Oklahoma, but yeah, growing up yeah. in West Texas, I no, I don't remember any earthquakes, and now it's a regular thing. Well, it's it's not a place where there's natural earthquakes, but yeah, if you if you uh, if you mess with the rocks enough, they'll they'll crack. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I the big picture is is uh, we're we're still continuing to act as if we can continue to operate in the way we've been operating. And uh, people are creatures of habit. Economies apparently are sort of creatures of habit. And it's very hard to change things. And 
people don't like governments trying to change things uh, on a big scale because it it's always clumsy. It always steps on somebody by accident and they get really mad. And, uh, but we have to, we have to do it. And um, we're not. And uh, it, it's always controversial. And uh, it, it, uh, I don't think people understand well enough uh, how serious it could get. And it, see, it seems to me that the changes that we need to make are far more radical than people realize or have been discussing. You know, it seems like we'd have to. I mean, we're talking about having to completely end emissions. Just stop. So, stop. Yeah, here's, here's a story, right? Because when we start talking about this in, back in the 90s, that the changes you have to make aren't that big. And we said, you know, you just have to do, you know, a little bit of adjustment here. And that was true in the 90s, right? If we had done it in the 90s, yeah. it, if we had started going down the, the road of, of moving off of fossil fuels 30 years ago, um, it would not have been a major adjustment. And now we're looking at... Um, I mean, back then we were saying, okay, if we don't if we don't behave ourselves, the uh, the world could warm as much as two degrees Celsius. And now we're saying, well, if we really step on things and really work really hard, the world could warm as little as two degrees Celsius. So we're already pushing. We're 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 hoping for what was once considered the worst case. And. Uh, that's just because we've been talking about it for 30 years. Well, a few of us have been talking about it for 30 years. And, you know, I, I, I figured all along, it seemed like it would take a long time for people to believe what we were saying. It doesn't sound all that plausible. But I did figure that once they started believing what we were saying, that they would, that they would, sit up and take notice. And that hasn't happened. That's that's the really weird part about it. That's that's the really sad part about it is there's been a big industry in coming up with excuses and reasons why we can't do these things. And that has enough power, enough attraction to people that we don't that we're still arguing. And um, yeah, so so it, it's not a world that's very good at pulling together these days. The people that could be doing something about it, could afford to do something about it, are all building bunkers and buying uh, uh, a condo in some of these uh, billionaire uh, get-away-from-it-all islands. So rather than doing what needs to be done, they're just going to say, well, we'll just wait and hope we survive. Yeah, yeah, and... and uh, Countries are, are sort of putting up borders to immigration so that, uh, you know, countries that, that are most badly hit, it's not my problem. Yeah, climate refugees. Yeah, there's, I mean, the amount of immigration problems that we're seeing now are just, um, it, it's, there's, there's like 200 million people in Bangladesh and it's not a wealthy country and it's at sea level and um, tropical storm prone. So what's going to happen to those people? Where, where yeah. are they going to go? Where's something that worries me um, and what I'm doing for people who are listening and not seeing what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm showing a map of all the airline traffic uh, specifically in the U.S., there's a website that tracks that stuff. There's a lot of airplanes in the air at any given time, and they're all spewing, right? Mm -hmm. so and what is that doing? You know, what, is, what effect right, is that um, having? Um, air travel and, and car travel are, do the same amount of damage per mile, roughly, approximately. But if you travel a lot, 
by plane, you can put on a lot more miles than somebody who doesn't travel by plane. So you're, you're spewing a lot on a per minute basis. And yeah, um, there's also some chemical damage to the upper atmosphere that has some, some effects as well. Um, it's bad. And um, they, everybody in the airline industry is looking at a growth period. They want, they want more. And uh, I don't know, maybe it's part, partly getting older. I, I find travel less and less interesting myself. It's more of a you know? problem just getting to the place that you want to travel <laughs> from. Much yeah, less and, traveling. It, it, it's, um, yeah, you, you, you don't put up with the discomforts as well when you get older, but also the discomforts seem to be increasing. Um, the airlines are treating people badly, and um, uh, what was the one that happened recently? Um, oh yeah, that Microsoft thing, right? Well, it wasn't really. Uh, it wasn't I mean, Microsoft. Microsoft was affected, but it was the, the actual screen cause screen. was I'm CrowdStrike. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, Fair enough. yeah, Fair yeah. Enough. It wasn't Microsoft's fault? <clears throat> hmm. But. Uh, uh, Delta just could not recover. And yeah. They had like people stuck in Atlanta airport for a week. They couldn't even get a taxi out. Yeah. Delta's always had a bit of a problem with that. Anyway, I had some friends that actually worked there for a long time and they finally just gave up because they were afraid it's just going to completely fall apart because their lack of maintenance and uh, paying attention to uh, planning, they said it would not exist. But, it, you know, I, I, I saw quite a few, you know, uh, tweets or suites or whatever you want to call them. People stuck in Atlanta airport and they, they were not happy and uh, <clears throat> nobody was helping him. I mean, they were literally sitting on the floor for three days. So, um, so anyway, I personally don't, I, I personally am making less demands on uh, the aviation system just because I don't like it. But uh, I'm a counter trend on that one. Um, people like to travel. Yeah, I know. And that, you know, I'm concerned about it, but I, I also think about, well, I think about that and I think about any number of things that are involved in the spew, basically, mm -hmm. uh, that if you remove those things, they're really... I mean, it's not incorrect to say that the economy would be affected, you know, and, and not affected in a small way at all. I mean, it would be a, a big sure. effect. I mean, really, like I say, we would have to radically change the way we operate. And, and we're not making any, any real movement in the direction of doing that. Yeah, so it doesn't is, seem that the problem's being solved. Aviation is, is, a, is one that is a piece of the economy that uh, it's really hard to know how we could, how we could decarbonize it. Um, we, could, we could at least build fast trains on each continent and it would, would be almost as fast. But, um, you know, if you're going across an ocean, uh, it's, it, we're kind of we don't want to go back to it taking a month to get across the ocean. Now they've been trying to build high speed rail in Texas for decades and it, it's an you know, it's impossible simply because they have so many landowners that say, No, you can't take my land and they're trying to yeah. uh eminent domain against all these folks who are well uh, fairly wealthy, many of them. Right. <laughs> so well, it, it's a no win situation for fast rail. Well, it's funny because the the uh, the interstate went through, um, so but yeah, it, it is it is hard to it is hard to pull that together. Um, yeah, I, I think aviation is is a good is a good place to think about how difficult it would be. Uh, but you know, one of the things we could have done thirty years ago is try to design a society that didn't require so much flying around. And, hey, we're having a conversation here, and uh, it's almost as good as being in a room. And um, yeah. it's, you know, there's 2,000 miles. Like all the gas we saved. Yeah, well, I, I know. I drive it once in a while, and, and 
It's a long drive. <laughs> well, we have a, a local billionaire, uh, Elon Musk, who is really uh, incensed because people think he's polluting with his many rocket launches out of South Texas and uh, and other places as well. And yeah, you know, I, I saw some figures that yeah, they they they're pretty dirty <laughs> in the things that they spew out when he does his many launches, but uh, I don't know if uh, that's a, a big impact or have you heard anything about what that contributes to the atmosphere? Um yeah, it's kind of like the volcanoes. It's uh, it's it's a big deal where you're in that spot, but there aren't that many of them, right? I mean, yeah, he's put up a lot more satellites than anybody ever had before, but it's still not that many. So um, I, I understand there's local impacts. I understand that people on that stretch of beach are not happy. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, I think I think the whole Musk phenomenon is pretty baffling and strange. Um, you know, it's just, there's there's things about him you can't help but admire, and there's other things about him that are just absolutely um, yeah, horrible. Making it's a really <laughs> weird mixed blessing. But well, he's making put, electric cars. Yeah, he's making electric cars. And Maybe that's his offset for SpaceX. Um, yeah, I don't know, um, but it, it's, uh, I would say my guess is, I haven't done the numbers, my guess is it's not used. That'd be my guess. Um, I, I think that um, we do focus a lot on transportation when we talk about these things, but um, transportation is, is about a third of it. Um, Electricity is another third of it. So um, we kind of don't think about it because it's not as visible to us. We're aware of the planes and the cars. We're not as aware of the uh, power plants, but every bit of electricity we use comes from something. And most places it's, it's gas these days. It used to be coal and now it's gas. So um, either way it's fossil fuel. One of the things impacting electricity, uh, particularly here in Texas, are Bitcoin mining operations. And those are hugely expensive and a big drain on the grid. And nothing a lot of people. To AI. Nothing compared to AI. AI That's true. AI is, is bottomless, bottomless demand of electricity. They're, uh, um, if you uh, if you'd invested in NVIDIA a couple of years ago, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd make out like a bandit. But uh, every one of those chips has to be powered. And um, people are thinking this is, um, it's the future. Um, I have my doubts. But anyway, uh, whether my doubts matter or doesn't, isn't the point. The point is, um, so, like, I read somewhere that Microsoft had promised to go uh, carbon neutral by such and such a day, and they were making progress, and now suddenly their their demands have doubled, and uh, all these other big players in the AI world are just throwing power at chips, and in the same way as Bitcoin, and if you think about it, nothing much is actually being produced. Um, well, Donald Trump is going to create a uh, supposedly uh, national reserve of Bitcoin, and no one, even in the Bitcoin industry, knows what the hell that is. Uh, I don't comment on <laughs> Donald Trump. I, I'm a Canadian. It's not my business. Uh, but yeah, I don't get what that is either. I... I was not shocked to see that Donald Trump was attracted to Bitcoin. <laughs> it sort of made sense. Birds of a feather. There you go. One scam deserves another. Well, I've been I was I've been reading a book uh, in which 
uh, people are being scanned, like carefully scanned and uploaded as they die. I mean, after you die, your your body is scanned and destroyed, and and your um, well, your brain is scanned so that your uh, consciousness, whatever that represents, is uploaded into the science fiction idea. Seriously, um, great Philip K. Dick novel. It's called Ubik. U B I K. Yeah, I remember Ubik. <laughs> Based on this idea. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's silly. It's it's not going to work. And, Our uh, next interview, by the way, is is, is going to be about Philip Dick. Hmm. Yeah, a couple of people who who knew Philip Dick pretty well are going to join us. Okay. Uh, but but this thing that I'm reading that one of the things about it is that the more people that are uploaded, the more uh, computing capacity they need. So it's, it's beginning to like divide. completely max out servers across the country you know <laughs> well i i don't think they're actually going to survive but they may think you know that the server may demand on its rights even though i don't think there's a person in there so well i always thought it was interesting to think about uploading your what your consciousness or whatever but it's really not going to be you anyway even if some it's not going to be you and I, my question is is it going to be anybody <laughs> so uh, I think if an AI says it's conscious, uh, you shouldn't trust it, right? Why wouldn't it say it's conscious? How would it know if it wasn't conscious? How would it know it wasn't conscious? How would hmm. it know it was lying? If it wasn't conscious, how would it know it's lying? Well, that's actually the problem with that's AI. The- AI doesn't know when it's lying. In, in general, it doesn't know when it's lying, but how yeah. can it detect its own consciousness or non-consciousness? How would it know? Anyway, so I don't think even somebody up manages to upload a, a reasonable simulation of their personality. Uh, I, I, I don't know if there's going to be anybody home, never mind themselves. So. Yeah, Neil Stevenson did a uh, novel a few years back about a a tech billionaire that had himself digitized and uploaded and he created a whole community of uploaded s- souls so to be that's and, the one i'm talking about actually yeah and it was apparently not a really good solution they had the same thing happening in the digital world that they experienced in the, the so-called real world it would get, got to be warfare and jealousy and all the <laughs> problems that humans have. So there's no digital solution for that. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess, I guess you get immortality out of the deal as long as the servers keep running. And that's, that's kind of weird, but anyway, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think that that's, that's another sign that uh, we're not doing well is that we're coming up with these, Huge power draining uses for for uh, computation that we didn't have before, and uh, I would say that at least until you solve this uh, immediate energy problem, um, you shouldn't even be pursuing these things at all. And uh, I mean that's my perspective. I would also like to point out while we think about it, and we're talking in science fiction mentality. Um, there's greenhouse gas climate change, but there's also the thing that people call urban heating or urban heat island. So that's just the direct heat from power consumption. And if there were no greenhouse effect, we would have a lot less climate change. We wouldn't have none because there's some just waste heat from all the stuff we're doing. If we do more and more and more, and basically if we run it off, probably it'll end up being nuclear. Um, all those nuclear plants are going to produce waste heat. And there's no actual way to export heat into outer space. You're just going to have to let the plant warm up. And so at a roughly 400 times current power consumption, you get back into climate change. So um, 
you cannot grow indefinitely. Um, 400 times sounds like a lot, but you know, how many doublings is that? That's uh, about nine, you know? So we're talking about two, 300 years, you're gonna get climate change all over again. Even if you go nuclear, as long as you just keep growing and growing and growing and throwing more and more things at computers, eventually you get back to climate change. Well, maybe SpaceX can send up uh, all that heat and uh, some of the rockets. And send That's it to true. Mars. That's true. You, you could, they need it you in could, Mars. You put could the computers on the moon or on Mars, but then you've got a bandwidth problem. So. <laughs> well, the solution seems to be to get rid of the humans. Oh, well, we're doing a good job of that, aren't we? Yeah. Well, I think so. I, I would, uh, yeah, okay, as long as we're talking in science fiction terms. I think the ideal population <laughs> is about a tenth of what we have. Make it a nice round billion, and you know, you don't you you don't make a baby until somebody dies, sort of thing at that point. And uh, yeah, we I think we'd be in much better shape if uh, and if we were less ambitious, you know, if we were less driven. Things are uh, we have enough stuff. Right? I don't I don't know why. I don't know why there's all this striving and, and jockeying for position and all this stuff. I mean, I would think that as human society progressed, it would be you know less desperate to jockey for position, and you know there would be more just food and shelter and clothing enough for everybody. And I, I don't really understand why we're not doing that. Um, I know that's considered socialist by some, but I think, you know, if you just fed people and gave them a roof over their heads, they'd be a lot happier. Yeah. I mean, we have a set of problems that seem to be attached to late stage capitalism and, uh, Late stage capitalism is kind of like a drug, you know, it's like it's it's hard for the humans who are preoccupied with late stage capitalism to imagine letting it go. What does late stage mean? I'm not sure. I don't know. <laughs> I think it just means that it's not it's where we are now. We've evolved to the point of a kind of hyper capitalism. Yeah, instead yeah, of a not, monkey on our back, we've got a capitalist on our back. It, it's yeah. Not, it's not like we have, you know, factories and jobs where we produce things. Everything's everything's all symbolic, you know. There's there's not that it's much true. actual making of things. There's been a huge transfer of wealth to uh to people who are already wealthy over the last like five decades or so. Mm. And uh and the way that the economy works the way that things work it's been sort of rigged to perpetuate that and to allow allow them to make more and more money and everybody else is sort of i mean it's like we're in servitude and you know there are there are people who argue that uh that ordinary people who are not wealthy uh are also not worthy and and they're not that important and that a few people should run things and should have all the you know not all but most of the wealth it's a weird it's a weird thing to me is this idea that you've got to put some set of people on top and everybody else is on the bottom um, I, don't, I don't yeah i mean we're 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 going far afield from where i where i you know, deserve my doctor thing. I'll turn it off. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, um, I, uh, this idea that people are worth what the market will bear um, is one way of looking at things. And the other way of looking at things is that we have a market so that people have access to the things they need. And those are very different ways of looking at what it is we're, we're trying to achieve here. Um, so, 
it's going to be hard to reconcile that. But it seems to me that the more, the better tools we have, the less opportunity an individual has to, you know, contribute, right? Um, yeah. And, and so it all becomes scrambling for capital. And it's only capital that produces wealth. It's not actually work or anything. I mean, you could argue that, that uh, Musk is, a, is an engineering genius, but you could also argue that he's a talented capitalist and that's primarily what he's achieved. I it's, think that's, yeah. Is, is you know, jockey. An argument. You know, he, he's, he's taken his initial advantages and cleverly made them into bigger advantages. Well, we have reached the end of our hour. Well, it's been fun. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. I was eager to discuss, especially the, well, the, the attribution thing for sure. And, you know, I've been thinking a lot about climate and mitigation and that sort of thing. And uh, I'm feeling a little hopeless right now. This didn't necessarily make me feel less hopeless, by the way. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm less of an optimist than I was. No, that's uh, it's fine. I understand. Yeah, There's a lot I'm of that too. going around. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Thanks, Michael. All right, see we'll ya. Talk to you later. Okay, Bye. adios. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network. 20 minutes into the future.